Hello and welcome. Thank you for taking the time to view our pre recorded session on vibrating wire and resistance type load cells. If you've tuned into some of our webinars before, you've probably met me, but you'll be spending the next half hour with me, Joelle Razor, GEACON's training coordinator. Our agenda today will start off with an introduction on the load cell and common applications. We'll then discuss the difference and similarities of the vibrating wire and electrical resistance load cells. Following that, we'll take a look at bearing plates, eccentric loading, and installation best practices before closing out with wiring and calibration. Load cells give it away in their name. They're designed to measure force or weight for various applications, simple yet effectively designed around the transference between applied force and material deformation. Load cells are primarily used to monitor compressive or tensile loads in various applications, often in conjunction with a hydraulic jack, which applies the load. Load cells can also offer a permanent means of monitoring the load throughout the life of tie backs, rock bolts, struts, or other supports. Moving on to applications, this is by no means an exclusive list, but a few of the common applications we see these instruments used for Tiebacks and rock bolts utilize load cells to monitor long-term performance of the anchorage system or to monitor the loading process. They can also be used as a check on the load determined by the hydraulic pressure applied to the jack during proof testing. Static pile load testing gives an accurate indication of an in-place pile's capacity. This type of test involves applying a load to the top of the test pile in conjunction with hydraulic jacks. Load cells can be utilized during static pile load tests to monitor the applied load at the top of the pile. For struts, load cells can be installed at the end of a strut in an open excavation to monitor loading in that strut. This is an application where strain gauges could be used for the same purpose, but when using a load cell, it provides a more direct means of monitoring the load. This session will focus on the vibrating wire and resistance load cells designed for applications similar to what we just described on the previous slide. There are numerous load cell options available on the market, such as hydraulic or pneumatic type load cells. They may also apply to some of these applications, but we just won't be covering them here. The load cells we will be discussing are designed for capacities from 100 to 10,000 kilonewtons. This is pertinent to geocon type load cells, but is by no means exclusive to all load cell types. There are manufacturers that offer designs for smaller or larger loads, depending on your application. The vibrating wire load cell consists of a steel cylindrical body, which can either be solid or manufactured with a center hole. Each vibrating wire load cell is manufactured with three to six vibrating wire strain gauges. That quantity is going to depend on the capacity of the load cell. The strain gauges are installed evenly in the body of the load cell. Multiple gauges are used to offset the effects of centric loading. The strain gauges are installed and set in holes from the top of the load cell. As you can see the black ring from the top view, there are three evenly spaced strain gauges with a groove to route all sensor wires back to the main readout cable. Readings are taken from each strain gauge and are averaged. These readings can be used in conjunction with the calibration factor to calculate the applied loads. The vibrating wire load cell is provided with an integral thermistor for monitoring temperature. If the load cell will be installed where it will experience varying temperature, it's recommended that temperature corrections be applied to the final calculations. The dimensions of the vibrating wire load cell will vary depending on the required capacity. These load cells are typically manufactured to order according to the specifications of the job. Depending on the size of the load cell, it can be provided with threaded holes for lifting eyes on the top of the load cell. Typically, this is the case for much larger size load cells. Looking at some of the advantages of the vibrating wire technology, the frequency output of the vibrating wire can transmit over very long cable lengths without any signal degradation. We've successfully tested our vibrating wire instruments with cable lengths in excess of 3000 meters with any effect on the output of the gauge. Vibrating wire technology has been available on the market for several decades and has a wide variety of options for data collection from manual readout boxes all the way through cloud-based data logging systems. 
The vibrating wire technology also has proven stability over long-term monitoring projects. It has the ability to continue operating for decades when properly installed and maintained. Vibrating wire load cells are best used for static load monitoring. Although there are dynamic analyzers for vibrating wire instruments, depending on the quantity, it may not be economically feasible to use them dynamically. So just something to think about if you're working with a dynamic application, which brings us to the electrical resistance load cell. This cell is made from an annulus of high strength steel or aluminum and is manufactured with four to 12 electrical resistance gauges in a wheatstone bridge configuration, similar to the vibrating wire load cells. They can be manufactured with a solid body or hollow core to accommodate any equipment that needs to pass through the load cell. The electrical resistance load cell consists of a cylindrical body and a cover. The electrical resistance strain gauges are etched onto the perimeter of the load cell body, and then the protective cover is permanently installed over the body of the load cell. Like the vibrating wire load cell, readings from each strain gauge are averaged to compensate for eccentric loading. They are also designed according to the specifications of your project in terms of capacity and then inner and outer diameter. Looking at some of the advantages and disadvantages for the electrical resistance load cell, typically the electrical resistance type load cell is used for dynamic monitoring as it's a voltage output instrument. They also have a wide range of data logging options and maybe a good solution where there's an existing data logger that isn't compatible with the vibrating wire technology. Although the voltage output is more universally data logged, a voltage signal will drop over long cable lengths, typically over 300 meters. Additional hardware can be installed at a data logger to overcome this voltage drop if needed. Because of the more complex construction compared to the vibrating wire version, they do tend to be a little bit more expensive and can carry a longer lead time. Design considerations for either vibrating wire or electrical resistance load cells are fairly simple. First, you'll need to know what your maximum load will be. This information will be important for the manufacturer to determine the appropriate dimensions for your project. It will also need to be determined if any anchoring materials will have to pass through the center of the load cells, such as a tieback, so the necessary inner diameter can be accounted for in the design. If there is some uncertainty, the center hole, if it's larger, it's possible to provide a bushing to fit the application better. It's much more problematic if the center hole is too small. Hollow core load cells can be used in the same applications as solid body load cells, and in some cases, adding a center hole can increase the outer diameter of a load cell to better fit an application that needs to meet a particular large outer diameter for the gauge. Keep in mind that the wall of the load cell body needs to maintain a certain thickness according to the load required. In some cases, overly large ID requirements with small load capacities may not be compatible with this style of load cell. Taking a quick look at cable options, either load cell type is typically provided with PVC cable. In some cases, polyurethane may be used as a more abrasion resistant option, and it also tends to perform better in colder temperatures compared to PVC. Either gauge can be provided with bare leads or a 10 pin connector. The way that the leads are prepped is really personal preference or the type of readout or data logger that you'll be using with the load cell, which we'll talk a little bit more when we get to wiring. To minimize eccentric and uneven loading, it's recommended that thick machined flat bearing plates and centralizer bushings, where necessary, be used as part of your test setup. Bearing plates should be machined flat and large enough to totally cover the load bearing surface of the load cell. It's not required, but as we've shown here, this bearing plate is manufactured with a step to help assure that the load cell is centered properly on the bearing plate. The thickness of the bearing plate is related to the maximum applied load and size mismatch that may exist between the load cell and hydraulic jack. The greater the size disparity, the thicker the bearing plate should be. Typical thickness for a bearing plate ranges from 25 to 75 millimeters. It's important to try to match the size of the jack loading diameter to that of the load cell diameter. As shown on the chart here, a mismatch in size can result in either over-registering or under-registering the load that's been applied. Thickness of the bearing plate can help alleviate this discrepancy. Bearing plate thickness, as we mentioned, will vary depending on the expected maximum load that's going to be applied to the test setup. 
too thin of a plate for the applied load and the plate will bend or warp, especially if the jack and load cell diameters are different as we showed on the previous slide. Having a sufficiently thick bearing plate, top and bottom, transfers the load more evenly through the stacked components of your test setup. Eccentric loading is one of the bigger contributors to inaccuracies of the load cell. Eccentric loading can result from a variety of different conditions as indicated here. Inclined configurations such as a tieback or rock bolt testing can increase the potential for this eccentric loading as it's very difficult to get all the components of the setup aligned exactly concentrically. With gravity acting on the setup, the eccentric loading may often be more pronounced on the lower end of the testing range until the load is significant enough to overcome the effects of gravity. As mentioned, the vibrating wire and electrical resistance load cells have several sensors installed around the perimeter of the load cell body. This allows for compensation of some of the eccentric loading. For pile load tests, specifically larger range load tests, use of multiple load cells and corresponding jacks can reduce the potential for eccentric loading. In the end, sometimes it's just not possible to eliminate all eccentricities, but it's better to understand that it may exist and could contribute to possible inaccuracies. There are often discrepancies noted in the field between the applied load of the hydraulic jack and the calculated load from the load cell. This can develop from the way the loading setup is configured. The alignment of all the components, the diameter differences between the load cell and the jack, inclination of the setup, temperature, friction on the loading surface, methods of measuring the loads on the jack, or calibration information of the jack can all contribute to inaccuracies registering between the two. While it seems outrageous, these factors, amongst other possible factors, can at times result in discrepancies in calculated load values of 15 to 20 percent. For best results, it's recommended that the load cell and actual hydraulic jack be calibrated together in a setup that closely resembles the actual test setup. By performing this type of calibration prior to installation in the field, it's possible to eliminate variables affecting the agreement and readings between the load cell and the hydraulic jack that you'll be using on your project. Moving on to some installation best practices. To help improve the accuracy of the load cell readings, attaining a good field zero reading is important. Before the load cell is set into place on the anchor or loading platform, place it on its side near the installation and take three sets of readings. The load cell can be rotated each time on its side. For vibrating wire load cells, each of the three or six sensors should be read at each resting position of the load cell. The strain gauges are all automatically averaged in the readout, typically. As mentioned, for tieback and rock bolt installations, the effect of gravity will increase the potential for eccentric loading on the load cell. This is particularly noticeable in the lower range of the loading process, as we mentioned earlier. Configurations for this type of installation will vary, but the lower bearing plate should rest against a whaler or bearing surface that is similar or larger in area than that of the bearing plate and be of sufficient thickness so it doesn't bend or warp under loading. Shown here, we have an example of a very large inclined multi-strand tie-down anchor system that's being stressed and then locked off at a specific load. The load cell is shown near the top of the configuration aligned concentrically with the rest of the components in the system. Here we have an example of a pile load test where the top of the pile will be loaded with six hydraulic jacks against an overhead reaction frame. That's tied down on the ends with a couple of piles installed to serve as reaction piles. Six load cells are installed concentrically to each of the hydraulic jacks. The jacks are then loaded simultaneously through a manifold system connected to hydraulic pumps. Signal cables from the electrical resistance load cell, as we mentioned, have either a 10 pin connector or bare leads on the monitoring end. Shown in this table and provided in the load cell manual is the wiring information for each of the leads in the signal cable. As we stated, whether or not you use a 10 pin or a bare leads is really up to you and the type of readout that you plan to use. For manual measurements of the electrical resistance load cell, our GK502 readout box can be used. This allows direct connection of a 10 pin connector from the load cell into the readout box. The readout can be configured to output raw values in millivolt volt digits or other 
Engineering units in pounds, kips, kilonewtons, and other units can also be output once the load cell gauge factor and field zero values are entered into the readout box. For okay. vibrating wire load cells, the signal cable can be fitted the same way we discussed, bare or 10 pin, to connect to different monitoring devices. As shown in the table here, as well as the load cell manual, several leads from the cable typically represent one of the vibrating wire sensors, with one lead acting as a common to them all. For most conventional vibrating wire multiplexer boards, a common jumper, like what we have shown here at the top of the slide, is usually needed to jump that common wire to the terminals for the other gauges. There's also a built-in thermistor in the vibrating wire load cell as we talked about for temperature measurements. Monitoring of the vibrating wire load cell can be done with a variety of data loggers as long as they're able to integrate and read the vibrating wire signal. Handheld vibrating wire readouts can be used to read the sensors in the load cell. The GK404 can be used to read each vibrating wire sensor individually. Going this route does require manual calculations to average the readings later. Another thing to consider if you're working with a higher quantity of load cells is that it may be time consuming to individually connect to each strain gauge and record its reading. There are options that will allow you to read all of the gauges at once and it'll automatically average them for you like the GK406 with the GK406 MUX that we have shown here. This can read all three or six vibrating wire sensors and average the output value with the correct gauge factor and zero readings entered in. It can also output load and engineering units. This setup does require the load cell cable be fitted with one of those 10 pin connectors that we talked about. Each Geocon load cell is calibrated vertically in-house in our press that has a 1200 ton capacity. Calibrations are traceable to NIST standards. The process involves initially loading the load cell a few times up to the rated capacity of the instrument. Then the actual calibrations are performed at selected intervals up to the rated capacity of the load cell. To improve the performance of the load cell in most applications, as we mentioned earlier, Geocon recommends that the hydraulic jack, pressure gauge, and other associated components be calibrated by the customer in a calibration facility of their choosing, in conjunction with the load cell, to determine a system gauge factor for the load cell. The system factor with all components stacked together will often be different than our laboratory developed gauge factor, and this can help improve the accuracy of the field test. A unique calibration report is provided with each load cell from Geocon. An example of the upper portion of an electrical resistance load cell calibration report is shown here. Information provided includes the model number, serial number, capacity, and the cable length attached to the load cell. Information on the initial cycling of the load cell, as mentioned previously, is included, and then the quantitative values resulting from the two calibration cycles are included on the sheet. From the calibration test data, both the linear gauge factor and then factors for a second order polynomial are determined from best fit trend lines. The C value of the polynomial equation is determined after a field zero reading is established. Setting the load cell L equal to zero and knowing the A and B constants, as well as the field zero readings, which would be R1, you can solve for C. Closing out our webinar today, our sales team is available to assist with all quote requests and order needs. Our seasoned sales team is able to assist with instrument questions and guidance on best fit for your applications as well. After order questions about setup and installation can be supported by our technical support group. We offer periodic training opportunities throughout the year, both in person and virtual events. Custom training opportunities tailored to your application are available on the Quest. We also offer various tutorials, free webinars, and resource videos, which are available on our website for training needs. Thank you for viewing.